good afternoon or evening, depending upon where you are, and welcome to our panel discussion called Building Trust Post-COVID. I'm Monica Marshall. I head up a practice at Ruderfin that focuses on integrating purpose, sustainability, social impact into an organization's DNA, and supporting their ability to leverage the impact they're making to drive their reputation. There's a great quote from Warren Buffett. Trust is like the air we breathe. When it's present, no one really notices, but when it's absent, everyone notices. Mm -hmm. History shows that the presence of trust brings many positive outcomes. Communities with strong sense of trust are better able to respond to crises and are more resilient. Trust is associated with stronger economic growth, increased innovation, greater stability, and better health outcomes. But we've seen, even well before COVID-19, that trust of governments, companies, organizations, media is very, very low. A 2020 study that came out before COVID really you know, hit the world found that no institution from businesses to government to NGOs and media were seen as both ethical and competent, that's a little scary, and none were considered fair. And while this is a study from this year, people's trust in governments in public and private institutions has been weakened really since the 2008 financial crisis. COVID, many studies though have shown that income inequality affects trust more than economic growth and, and COVID has exacerbated income inequality across the world. And the rise in inequality is contributing to a weakness, uh, a weakening in trust in capitalism. Politics has eroded trust. A recent study in the U.S. shows that the politics around health institutions has eroded trust in their COVID-19 recommendations. The proliferation of fake news is eroding trust in the media. And in some cases, though, it can increase trust in the government, but it really depends on what side you are um, in terms of believing in those who are in power. And bad behavior of companies has eroded trust in the private sector. Lack of trust often leads to a lack of confidence. And when thinking about our discussion today and about the importance of leadership as we manage the pandemic and build back our economy, we know that the lack of trust, confidence, and poor leadership can seriously impact our lives. Take the COVID vaccine and the, the, the high percentage of people who are not necessarily believing in its efficacy. This can lead to people not accepting the vaccine, getting sick, or even dying. Lack of trust and confidence and poor leadership can affect our livelihoods as well. Countries, companies, organizations fail when you have poor leadership and no trust. And when we think about the global uh, economic recovery, we cannot afford not to succeed. And with a decrease in trust, something I've been tracking is an increase in activism, employees, consumers, investors. Activism is on the rise, and particularly when we think about the youth. Everyone knows Greta Thunberg and the movement she's helped shape around climate change, but behind her are thousands of young activists fighting for their future. The activism is volatile, volatile and unpredictable. We did do a study about um, the last quarter of 2019 where we talked to about 10,000 people and over half of them had taken some sort of action for or against a social cause or a company or an uh, organization. When we went back to them a few weeks ago, we saw a slight decline in the people taking action, um, which could be contributed to COVID, uh, but it was also kind of surprising we saw a slight decline given the Black Lives Matter movement and the seemingly very activist tone of the United States. But what was interesting in this is that of the people who did not take action last year, 25% actually became activists. Um, but of the people who did take action, about 31% didn't take action. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that the profile of who's an activist is unclear. It's difficult to predict who's going to spark or what's going to spark an activist response. And no one is immune to being in the crosshairs of activism. Trustworthy leaders bring stability, excitement, and hope. With trust being in question, we can understand the rise of activism. So with me here today are four esteemed colleagues who will talk about different elements of trust and leadership, the questions COVID have raised related to the performance of leaders, the role of technology in amplifying all the different nuances of leaders and so much more. 
Linda Klein is here. She is a senior managing shareholder for Baker uh, Donaldson. Linda's legal practice includes most types of business dispute prevention and resolution, internal investigation, contract law, professional liability, and risk and crisis management. She's worked extensively with clients in the construction, higher education, and pharmaceutical industries. Etty Levini is a member of the Steering Committee for Women Wage Peace in Israel. Et Etty is a former Israeli politician who served as a member of the Knesset. Etty con currently serves as a board member for a few companies and is a lawyer by trade and very involved in Israeli civil society and organization. Farah Pandith is a senior fellow of Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Farah is a world leading expert and pioneer in countering violent extremism. She's an adjunct senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations and is head of strategy at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. Farah has served as a political appointee for George H. W. Bush, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama, and was appointed the first ever special representative to Muslim communities by the Secretary of State, Hillary Rodham Clinton. And Valmiki, who goes by Val, uh, Mukherjee is the chairman and founder of Cyber, Cyber Future Foundation. Val is a globally recognized expert in the cyber and cloud security industry with a focus on innovation and collaboration to address the information security needs of the future. Mm -hmm. He's a cyber futurist, a diplomat and evangelist who promotes international cooperation and collaboration on trusted cyber. But he does have a day job, <laughs> and that's a managing director for Ernst & Young. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn to Linda. And I know, Linda, when we were um, talking about, you know, the whole trust in post-COVID, you had some really interesting insights around trust and our ability to, to get back into the office. And, and we know how important it is for our, you know, social interaction, for business growth and all those other uh, critical aspects. I want to give us some of your insights. Well, thank you, Monica, and it has been a privilege getting to know the other panelists. Uh, everybody is uh, in for uh, quite the treat uh, this afternoon uh, or evening, wherever you are. Uh, and I am Linda Klein. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia in the United States. And I also bring uh, another perspective besides uh, my law practice, and that is uh, that I served as the first woman president of the State Bar of Georgia and as president of the American Bar Association, which is a worldwide professional association where global justice issues are very central to our work. Uh, and my law practice involves uh, efficiently resolving disputes that are between businesses, trying to use voluntary dispute resolution where people come together to solve their disputes, uh, such as uh, mediation and arbitration instead of the courts. Uh, I was reflecting on the 100 years since the last worldwide pandemic and how much better connected our world is. Uh, global air travel today you know, spreads the virus around quickly, but our technology is how we stay connected while we're in isolation, so it's very important. And the number of sources of information continues to just skyrocket. Now, people are getting medical information and even medical treatment on their computers. And this high-tech connection, social media, instant internet information is even more of a factor in how leaders manage and how they build or lose trust during a pandemic. And even though you cannot contract a virus through your mobile phone or your computer, you can become infected with misinformation and doubt, uh, something that can be very harmful as you make personal decisions regarding your safety with a virus spreading in your community. Uh, when you get information from a trusted source, uh, you're much more likely to believe it. Uh, think about how children trust their mothers. Uh, and just as our mothers were not always right, not all of this misinformation is intentional. Uh, Misinformation's been with us, I guess, since the dawn of time. And it's just that now it can move around the globe instantly and be presented in a way using, I guess, uh, increasingly more available computer technology uh, that the message becomes very tailored to the recipient. And this makes the misinformation more believable to the person who's reading it. And hearing about how deadly this virus is, people are just desperate for anything that can help. 
Uh, they want to tell their friends about hopeful new treatments. And many times these are just theory undergoing testing that sadly turn out to be unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. The problem in a pandemic or anything unprecedented is that leaders are learning as we experience it. We call that learning on the fly. And as a lawyer, I found my clients were calling me with questions that were never considered by the courts. Uh, regulations were being mandated and changed. And sometimes they were being changed more than one time in a day. And we had various levels of government, the city and state and national that created rules that sometimes contradicted each other. So business leaders were trying to lead, but the facts were changing quickly and there was no precedent upon which to rely. And, and of course, this type of confusion leads to misunderstanding and misinformation. And again, it can be entirely unintentional. So I guess it's a pandemic of not knowing what information to trust and who to trust. You normally think that people will turn to their government, either local or national for protection and information because there still remains high levels of trust globally in government. However, what I've seen is people trusting their employers more. Well, what did the best employers I saw, what did they do? They communicated that they were putting their employees first above the shareholders, above the customers, above all other stakeholders. And they proved it in their actions as well as their words. They were nimble, they were quick to change when they needed. And these employers built trust through their actions. They motivated employees, they encouraged them to physically distance, to wear masks and et cetera, instead of forcing them to do it. Well, how did they do that? With empathy, showing each employee that her role is meaningful, showing that with everyone's cooperation, we're going to win and they didn't show fear. Uh, they developed messages much like social media advertising geniuses. Uh, when new information suggests the message needs to change, change it, and they say why they do it. Uh, you mentioned the vaccine, and, and regarding the vaccine, you talked about the skepticism. I think there's more skepticism about whether it's going to be safe at, that rather than whether it's going to be effective. Uh, many Americans remember the swine flu vaccine in the 1970s when the vaccine gave people Guillain-Barre syndrome. So it's going to take a lot of trust to get people to take the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And one final point, to go back to the office, employees will need to trust their employers. They're going to need to believe their employers have their best interest and their health at heart. And to hold on to that trust, Employees are going to believe, need to believe that their employers are getting the best available information, communicating it openly and honestly, using science-based testing. They need to feel appreciated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, you bring up so many uh, important points, and I know Val in a bit is going to talk about the misinformation, but the, the trusted source and the importance of leadership. One thing I was really impressed by when at least it, you know, COVID became a, a reality in the United States was the uh, tech industry lead actually in coming out and saying, we are going to stand by and we're going to support our employees. All of our employees, our contract employees, our part-time employees, we're going to extend our health benefits. I had never seen that kind of reaction or commitment. Um, and I think it really set the tone for business leadership. And honestly, through all of this, even though there is this question around trust, I do think business leadership, the businesses have come out and really shown that leadership that um, that no one else has. It's filled a real void and hopefully they can continue that. So Etty, I know that um, you have a very uh, strong point of view about the role of, of female leaders and you also have some great insights on what makes a leader very strong or perhaps not so strong. And given your 
your your background that I uh, explained, and I'm sure I've missed some points. So please feel free to uh, illuminate on on your background. Can you talk a little bit about how the trust varies from country to country, and really um, share some examples of of leaders who've really you know led through COVID uh, in a way that it has built a true following? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, first of all, of all, do you hear me? It's okay. Do you hear me? It, okay. Yes. Uh, I want to yes, relate to what Lin Linda said. Uh, uh, in Israel, it's the same situation. We follow the United States. There is a great crisis in government, and uh, the trust of the public and the people is very low. And uh, there is a lot of demonstrations going on. And we are, as you see, we are in a lockdown now for the last two or three days. Uh, um, not a strict one, but it's a lockdown. And also demonstrations, demonstrations are banned, are not allowed, which create a lot of danger and distrust. And people are trying to break the whole... Uh, the, the all orders now. Mm -hmm. And who knows what will be now uh, when we have a prime minister who is uh, facing a, a, a low charges, the facing court, uh, and the, the people don't have, uh, don't have trust in any of the governmental institutions. So let's see uh, who is successful now in the world. So I checked six places and more where there is the women prime ministers. I have all the data like two months ago and I checked it today to see what is going on with the COVID-19 in these countries. Well, there is a, a kind of increase in the cases. There is a starting a second wave in some places but still they are doing much better than the male uh, leaders, the male prime ministers. So I checked Germany with Angela Merkel. I checked um, Finland with uh, Prime Minister Sanna, 34 mm -hmm. years old, with a coalition uh, of four uh, parties headed mm -hmm. by women. Taiwan is doing extremely well with the prime minister. There is Denmark, and there is, uh, who is the last? Norway. So we have six, we have more, but we don't have too many women uh, prime minister. As far as I remember, I think we have only 19 in the world. But they are doing better. So I try to check, uh, and there is a lot of material on these issues in the papers and uh, all kinds of research has done. If it's a phenomenon that we have to look at, or it just uh, it depends on each country and each person or each prime minister. But there is a few things that are uh, co uh, that connects all all of them. The way they they lead their their people, it's much different than a masculine way of being a prime minister at the, at United at the United States or England or Brazil or this or India even these places that there is very masculine uh, leadership, and uh, what that means, first of all, they are risk averse. So they were they, they were very quick and at the lockdown in the first stage. They don't take risks. And uh, if you remember uh, the prime minister, the the president of the United States and uh, uh, Boris Johnson in England, they they were taking risks. They didn't believe any anybody, nothing. Uh, they they really mocked at the situations. It, it doesn't happen at when the women are the leadership positions. They are, have a kind of collective leadership. They are not individualistic. They are taking advice of the expert. They are uh, communicating. They are having taking advice. They are uh, listening to the what is the new uh, trends and ideas and the inquiries in, the, in this. 
They are, uh, the, their leadership is coaching and not dominant. And they are broadening the idea of security. Security is not just wars and uh, conflicts. Security is human life. And they are trying to respond to it. Uh, so we, it's emerging uh, may, maybe a new leadership uh, 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 person, let's say, a new form of leadership that will be available, that will be relevant, uh, I hope, also after the COVID-19 with all these climate changes and the, the, the world in the turmoil, the, the leadership of women that are uh, sympathetic, that they are taking advice, they are among their people, they are considering the people, they are not uh, overwhelmed with their ego and their abilities and they know better than anything. So I hope, I hope also in Israel, uh, but all over the world, there will be more and more women that will take the lead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I spent many years at the UN, and one of the things that really struck me was the role of women in development. And when we would support women as heads of household, the advancements they, they made, and this is not going to turn into a VALA conversation about women or men, but I, I do believe and I hope that we do take some of these learnings um, and people apply them and, and we do get more women leadership because the world will be better for that. But Farah, I know that, um, you know, you've done a lot of writing and, and a lot of research and are, are a very big advocate on, um, you know, extremism, on hate. Um, and part of that is really thinking about the language that's used and what can spark that kind of visceral reaction and, in you know, as we're talking about leadership and the the need to really create trust, can you talk a little bit about how that can create a destabilizing factor, which I think we can all assume, but what are some things that you've seen that actually can mitigate that? Well, so first of all, um, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you might be, um, and thank you. I, I really learned a lot from the two speakers before me, and I just want to say, I know this is not a panel about women, but boy, do I hope that what uh, Etty said comes to pass, because what we know is a woman is a child's first teacher, a mom is a child's first teacher, and what happens in the home matters. So thank you for what, the words that you said. Um, I want to take a step back, um, and I'm going to push back on what Horasis um, set, set this panel up to be, um, building trust post-COVID. And I would argue that you can't build trust post-COVID if you don't understand the ecosystem prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and to understand that the system that is underlying all of our actions um, on this planet uh, and, and the trust institutions, if you want to call them that. Um, Monica, you talked a couple, about a couple of them. You talked about government. You talked about uh, the business sector. You talked about nonprofits um, um, and the media. But I want to add a couple more in there because they make a difference to the ecosystem that I know drives people um, to be fearful. <laughs> uh, and fear and trust kind of go hand in hand. Uh, there are two other institutions I'm going to add to the list that you brought up, Monica. One is religious organizations, um, and the second um, are regular citizens themselves. And you touched upon that when you talked about the demographic of young people and activists uh, and what we know about um, millennials, what we know about Gen Z, and what we will see come to pass with uh, Generation Alpha is a different set of priorities around what's authentic and what is not authentic. And I know Val is gonna talk about um, the technology piece and conspiracy theories which add into this. But, but let me just, I, I'm painting that picture because I think it's important to understand what is the system we're talking about for trust and how do leaders trust within that. Um, and then talk about um, the things you can control and the things you can't control. Mm -hmm. You cannot, the, the timeline here is not something anyone control can control. In a time of crisis, you can't slow down or pick up the virus. We'll use that or we could use climate change or whatever crisis we might be dealing with. Um, so you can't, you can't control that. You can't control, um, in addition to that, how bad the crisis gets um, or unforeseen agitators. But you can control several things. You can control how authentic you are. 
Um, mm -hmm. And that authenticity is critical. It's critical for the people who are in your sphere, whether as Valerie was talking about, um, it's a business leader who tells their people they can come back into their, into their offices, um, whether it is a leader of a nation who says it's okay to do this or this, whether it's the secretary general of the UN um, what, whatever we're talking about, that authenticity, that trans, that transparency, that clarity are critical aspects to, to building the kind of ecosystem we need so that bad actors are not taking advantage mm -hmm. of the, the black holes that are left. And unfortunately, what COVID has shown us, and I'm, I'm not telling any of the listeners anything that they don't know, is that because of the lack of excellent leadership, from the majority of leaders in our world during this time of crisis. Bad actors have found ways to get in to the system and move people along a conveyor belt in different ways. Whether it is the mask craziness that's going on in our country, in the United States, uh, the politicizing a mask thing, whether it's taking science and turning it on its head, whether it's talking about other unforeseen things that you may not believe are going on in the world of QAnon, um, but become mainstream, these things impact the crisis that we're dealing with. So it's not just the hell of a virus that is infecting millions of uh, people around the world. And in the United States, over 200,000 people have died because of all these things that are happening in the ecosystem that we are not able to control. Leadership matters. And so what the question becomes is, what does a leader need to do? The, a leader needs to be first and foremost, trustworthy. What does that mean? It means that you're not looking at a, a political conversation in a time of crisis. You're looking at solutions for all of the people. And, 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 you know, I'm not, this is not a referendum on the United States and how bad we've handled COVID, but rather to say, I could give you examples in other parts of the world when you've made it political, as opposed to I care about all of you, all of the citizens in my country. Um, you can look at the language of the leaders of the World Health Organization or the United Nations, and you can see a stark difference the way they've talked about the equality of people versus leaders in other nations who somehow have a hierarchy of who's more important than another. So that that ability to be a leader for everyone, to be equal is really important. Um, I also want to say that um, <laughs> you need to have a, a plan and whether that plan is stuck to uh, in terms of the preparedness and how you go forward or not, the, the people listening need to believe so that they can trust that there is some sort of execute, you can execute something. There is a strategy that makes sense. And in the lack of strategy, you have chaos, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you need believability, authenticity, clarity, but, the, the, but here's the most basic thing. And this ties to your point, Monica, about, um, about bad actors. If you have a leader that doesn't use language that is careful, and designed to de-escalate the fear, you are going to see an increase of bad actors using that black hole to be able to do what they want to do with it. Um, and I will say um, the rise of hate in, in the United States is not singular. The rise of hate globally is off the charts. The numbers of, and, uh, of countries that, that believe that the Holocaust didn't exist, for example, is nothing anyone could have ever predicted. So what is going to happen next? This is connected to a crisis like COVID because um, in all of these spaces, um, there's violence that can be connected to these bad things that are happening. This isn't just moving people to be radicalized and hate others. It is what happens when you have hateful communities that then take it to the next level um, and it, they become violent. And what I know to be true, because I've been working on this um, in many different dimensions since 9-11, is that um, we haven't gotten a hold on how to puncture an ecosystem that allows hate to rise, even though there are solutions that are available and affordable right now. So my final point is, is, is this. So what are the solutions? What I'll go back to what I said when I began. It takes, what is the ecosystem? It takes all of society to de-escalate the power of hate. It isn't just government. It's not just the business sector. It is those two NGOs, regular citizens in every way, shape or form that says, 
who are our authentic leaders that can make sure that this is not allowed to thrive. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to stop and, um, and let, and let my next speaker go. So thanks. Wow. That, there are so many things in there that I want to expand on, um, but I do want to turn it to Val. And uh, honestly, your last point about puncturing the ecosystems that allow hate to rise. Yeah. So, Val, you want to tackle that? <laughs> I, I know. I mean, where do I start from? But, but uh, the, the one thing I wanted to mention from the, from the get-go is that, you know, the woman in leadership and the, and the leadership of women, right? Those two things are... are ex- uh, I, I cannot if, emphasize how they're important for me. I grew up in a matriarchal society. That's where I come from, back in India. Uh, it, and uh, and you know uh, there is a there is a natural healing power in that. I I, I and conceal. I mean, it's bringing people together. I, I think that is where I define the woman in leadership, and that's what we are uh, experiencing within uh, you know my day job at EY. We have Kelly Greer who took up as the as the chairwoman of uh, of EY. And and it's been a different vibe altogether. So thank you for what you are doing individually to contribute. And at the, your point, of course, I, I was surprised you didn't mention the Queen Bee uh, and Jacinda Ardern, <laughs> New Zealand. But uh, but again, add add it to the list too. She's one of my favorite. But uh, you know, to expand from the, on the topic that you just mentioned, I think each of you have hit on really important uh, critical points within this ecosystem that needs to be my, my work at CFF is focused on public private partnership to build collaboration and trust. Right. And, and security cannot be without trust it, that that's the underlying concept of, of security is that, you know, you're, you feel secure when you, when you trust your surroundings, you trust the people, you trust who, who you are around mm-hmm. and, and to break it down to each of the points that you mentioned, trust in people and leaders, trust in the, in, in the data that we get and the information that we drive out of it, Trust in the technology and the platforms that those technologies uh, build, right? Trust in organizations and nations. Mm-hmm. And that is where I think that the, what you mentioned uh, um, about uh, the, the, the puncturing of the hate and the going into the, in the region of trust. And then finally, trust in cyberspace and cyber commons, right? Now we are you're using a public utility, which is cyberspace and the internet and all that is there. But there is 90% of the cyberspace is not actually accessed by regular people. The 10% that is causing the damage, and imagine the amount of uh, 90% data that's going in to feed into that, right? Uh, and I think, you know, uh, coming to this discussion, uh, the last few last few iterations and also the, some, of the, uh, some of the forums I've spoken with, I, uh, I don't know how much it is being realized, but... As much as we are dealing with the pandemic, uh, I completely give credit to WHO for bringing out the infodemic perspective of it, right? We are dealing with pandemic and the infodemic is making it worse. Uh, and, and where does it start with? It starts with the trust, right? So the way the social media and the way this, the whole info, information propagation has uh, you know, evolved over time, the trust in media has gone down and down because again you know we live in a very multipolar world people really are are torn between who to trust and not so they trust social media and the way it's built it typically is if somebody likes something or pushes something and you actually amplify that by your uh, endorsement right so you're not really you don't have to worry about the fact and where it's coming from you you are actually pushing it because just your friend or someone you know um and without you know with due sincerity i think that's how that's what you do you propagate it 99 percent of the of the of the data that's going out and we did this uh, survey at global information security survey at ey and and also the studies at cff that only one percent you can actually trace back to in terms of the data because of the volume of data it's, it's about volume right and how the volume is there and how it's being amplified so uh, you know some somehow everything is so sensationalized and i think people it's it's attacking people's sentiments People latch onto the sentiments and not to the data or the fact behind it. So I, I think, you know, being a security professional, we, we grew up uh, learning that trust but verify, right? Um, to a security paradigm now where we are saying zero trust because of the way the information is collected and, and, and disseminated and propagated, uh, whether it's an enterprise world or it's in, or, or it's in public world. Um, and I believe that's where, that's where the problem lies. Let's talk about the solutions. I think the, the, the solution lies with us. I mean, we, uh, when I say us, it's not just this forum, not just the folks we're discussing about it, but also 
but, you know, sharing it with the rest of the world. And and, and I, I'm, I really give it to people who are probably um, uh, less introvert than I am. But I think technological people are usually, you know, they, they keep it to themselves. <clears throat> but I think it's about time that we, the technologists uh, take it up. And, and I and what you mentioned, Monica, about return to work, I think that's that's where technology probably did uh, something right uh, um, and intentionally, which is basically ensuring that people can work from where they can want to work and mm-hmm. giving, them the, uh, giving them the freedom to, to uh, you know, to use the technology to its truest form. But now that exposes us to a, to a huge degree of the cybersecurity implications that it has. My, my son's going out of school, out of the next room, and so many of us are working from home. And I think that just gives a big, big impetus to uh, cybercrime because, uh, you know, the people can impersonate you or, or take a, a hold of your credentials. So uh, I, I think it definitely each of these topics could, could be a forum in itself. But, um, but I think uh, it, it is of, of, of imp- immense importance and significance that we realize uh, where information is coming from and how it's propagated and the authenticity of that. So absolutely give credit to uh, you, um, uh, Farah, for bringing up the authenticity piece because that's where it lies, right? Authentic- authenticity and the intention behind those people who are propagating that information. So thank you. I'll back my time to you. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, you bring up a lot of really good points. I think the infodemic is truly, you know, something that, erodes trust and it's unfortunate. Um, We do have a question uh, from one of the viewers and Etty, I think I'm gonna hand this over to you. The question is, how is masculine leadership defined? Was Sweden masculine and not imposing lockdowns perhaps most masculine in the world? Masculine is uh, ego, uh, a big ego. It's uh, it's speaking about power and uh, victory and fighting and uh, uh, risk taking, etc., etc., etc. This is not uh, scientific what I say, but if you look at these six leaders that I brought, you can find in each and every of them this kind of the opposite way. They are considered, they are empathetic, you know, and everything. Yeah contain and uh, this makes a difference and this makes a difference i don't know about sweden sweden is was it success and then not a success and i don't know but denmark is a success yeah. and finland is a big success okay mm-hmm. thank you so i yeah i know we only have a few minutes left so i'm going to ask each of you to give just your parting words and and really based on the question of everything that we've heard here from you know the the you know requirements of governments to step up and leaders to be trustworthy authentic for companies to communicate and be um show empathy uh to bring in more compassion to be you know very careful about the type of words that we use and then the, you know, whole kind of what you brought up, Val, of the misinformation and, you know, cybersecurity and and protecting our own, you know, selves and our own um, rights and information. With this as a backdrop, which is a lot, and I'm sure everybody in the world is equally exhausted by everything that we're going through, how can leaders build trust today? And what advice would you give to young leaders as they're entering into the world to think about how they should lead what they should take from for who what they should take from inspiration from other leaders so um etty why don't we start with you just a couple of minutes just a minute on that (laughs) my advice to new leaders uh i hope the new generation uh, will be different from our generation or the uh, the mid generations because they see how bad it is, and they will have their their uh, uh, their thoughts about it. And we have young leadership in Israel that are uh, quite different from what's going on. And this kind of civil uh, civil uh, demonstration and the uh, energies are uh, symbolizing the new generation, the new ideas. We don't want to live with what what's happening uh, till now. So uh, there is not a uh, one 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 word to to tell them, but be different. It's not the way 
to lead the world. Great, and Linda? Um, very quickly, I would say that young leaders should know to be transparent, uh, to have proof for the facts that are based on science and trusted sources, be genuine, you cannot fake empathy, and I was hoping we would have time to talk about these apps that follow you to see if you've been exposed to the virus and privacy experts warning about that technology and people who might accept the intrusion or refuse it for the good of the group. And what if employers require it? What if uh, they refuse? So those are the kinds of things that I think are very important uh, as when, for new leaders to consider before requiring anyone to do anything. Great. And Val? I would say, you know, that from a cybersecurity angle, I think you have to be careful where you're getting information from. Please trust and verify both. Uh, trust, but verify. I'd say trust. Uh, verify, then trust. Turn it on its head. And and be, it, it, from a leadership point, we are seeing that the core leadership tenets has not changed over the world. I think it's been like it goes through cycles of who, who you deem as a leader, right? I mean, if you think about... Uh, uh, you know, Dr. Fauci, I've just mentioned a name because he became this trusted leader that everybody wanted to look for, right? A, a name and a face that matters. I think words matter. Mm -hmm. So uh, so leadership, uh, you don't have to, you just don't have to, you know, you can demonstrate leadership during this time, definitely be empathetic and definitely communicate, be intentional and, and be authentic about yourself and what you intend to do. Great. And Farah? I would say to build coalitions because I think, uh, what we have definitely seen uh, in the success models is that you have to go across the aisle. You've got to build coalitions um, and develop a, a collaborative approach to community so that you can all trust each other and it's not perceived in a power dynamic that is not going to be efficient. Mm -hmm. Great. I would, so with I would, that, I'd like to thank you all for joining and thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, two, two words to the, the leadership, new leaders, humble and modest. Thank you. Have to thank be. You. Mm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Okay, well, thank you very much. This was a great conversation and it was so nice to meet you all and uh, look forward to um, having future thank conversations. You. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.